Coming up on Studios America, Blaze TV's Dave Rubin is here with his thoughts on the end of the pandemic. Stephen Gutowski from TheReload.com gives us everything we need to know about the ghost gun issue. And another day means another change in the CDC's guidance for COVID. So let's forget what we knew yesterday and focus on what we need to know today as we do the science. Well, everyone out there, I hope you're following the science today. Remember, always follow the science because the science is the science and the science is always right. Until scientists tell you different science is right, then that science is right and you're an a-hole for following the old science, which is no longer science because it's no longer right because scientists told you it was wrong. It's easy, just follow the science. It's been an interesting couple of weeks here as we kind of come to the end of the pandemic. There's a, a I think a pretty important op ed uh, today written by uh, Tim Carney in well, the Washington Examiner, and he said the pandemic is over. It's over. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit later on in the program. Is it over? You know, it certainly feels this way. We've been saying for a while here that we think that once vaccines are available to everyone, they don't have to get them. You should never force them on anyone. But as long as they're available to everyone, there should be no more restrictions. This, this, this should be over. Uh, and, you know, it does seem like the numbers are going in the right direction. We'll get into that here a little bit in a second. But I want to talk to you quickly to start off here about the mindset of the media and the left. There has been uh, something of an identity built among people in the media, among people on the left, where there's a virtue of wearing masks. There's a virtue of staying away from each other, from not going outside. It's become the good people do those things and the bad people do those other things like, you know, shaking hands and seeing each other and taking off their mask outdoors while they're running. That has become almost a religious issue. It's 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 not about science. And that's what's so frustrating about it. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. We played this, uh, I think, yesterday. But it was a clip that made the rounds a little bit. It's Anthony Fauci talking about taking off your mask outside. This is before the latest batch of CDC guidance that came out. And people talked about the Fauci thing because, frankly, anything Anthony Fauci says apparently is news for some reason. I don't know why. But take, it, take more special notice about Gail King in this clip. Watch. Dr. Fauci, please help us with the mask situation. I know we're told we can wear it outside. We don't have to wear it outside. But I'm telling you, I was in New York, where I live, mm -hmm. walking down the street. I just stopped a random lady. Stopped and I said, have you been vaccinated? She said, yes. I said, mm -hmm. me too. Why are we wearing our masks? She goes, I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, because right. I think we all feel. And I said, me too, ma'am, me too. I think we all either feel guilty, guilty. or we feel it's not time or not we time. see everybody else doing it. It's monkey Everyone see, else. monkey do. Mm -hmm. Is it? Do you really think it's Look okay? Because I still feel judged. I feel I'm people judged. giving you the side eye. Side eye. It's not no, comfortable, it, Dr. Fauci. Not comfortable. We, I know, Gail. Yeah, we, we've got to make that transition. All right, if stop for a second. We don't need the whole you, Fauci part. That's the part that matters. I mean, listen, she's putting her hand over her face. She's telling you she's not comfortable, unmasked. Now, I can understand, you know, wearing a mask and feeling uncomfortable wearing a mask. That's the opposite of what we normally do, right? That could be uncomfortable. She's uncomfortable not wearing a mask now. Did you feel the kind of terror in her? I mean, you saw her hands are covering her face. She's giving you all these th different emotions. She's scared. She's feeling like she's being judged. She doesn't know if it's time yet. This is all nuts. It's got nothing to do with the science. Let me give you another example. Here is Rachel Maddow. Part of it is that I feel like I'm going to have to rewire myself so that when I see somebody out in the world who's not wearing a mask, I don't instantly think you are a threat <laughs> or you are selfish or you wow. are a COVID denier and you definitely haven't been vaccinated. I mean, we're going to have to rewire the way that we look at each other because the CDC's guidance, which she just told me, we are sure, is that if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask except in very specific circumstances. And so that means as we change that as a country, we are going to look at each 
each other differently and have to unwire our preconceptions about what a mask or a lack of a mask means. Maybe part of the problem was the initial wiring. I'm just going to throw that out there. You know, the fact that you were wired to believe everyone you saw was a threat to you, possibly a problem, uh, that everyone was some evil COVID denier that wasn't taking into account their own personal uh, situation. That may be a larger problem. I will say it's a good thing, a good thing, that the left is discussing this in some way. You know, I, I talk to restaurant owners from time to time, and they always tell me, like, look, you know, it's we we know everyone wants to open up and we appreciate that. But you have to understand, like, if it's only conservatives coming back, we're going to go out of business. So we need we need crazy liberals coming too, uh, back to our restaurants. And it's good that the left is going to under have to deal with this and they're going to have to go through basically therapy to figure out how to unwind what they've done to themselves over the past year. It's good that that's happening. So I, I, I and I think it's, you know, honestly, as a, just a, a broadcaster, it's a it's a it's a smart moment for Rachel Maddow to have. I know it's weird because she's you know, she looks like a lunatic to you and I. Um, but, you know, to be vulnerable and to, to, to be honest with your audience and say tell your audience what you're going through. That's a smart thing to do as a broadcaster. And I think it's a good thing that that's going to have to happen on the left if our economy is ever going to get back to normal. But these are frankly insane moments. Right. I mean, uh, this is craziness. This is not following the science. This idea that the science was always on the side of the left has always been crazy. It's not true. It's not true. Uh, it wasn't true before COVID. It's not true now. Um, we need to have confidence in our products here. We've got vaccines that are doing amazing things. Let me give you a, an example of this. This is a chart that comes out and this is uh, basically um, hospitalizations from the peak of hospitalizations back in January and how they've dropped off, but separated by age group. You don't normally see it separated by age group. And what you see here is that the by far the biggest drop in hospitalizations percentage wise is people are people 80 plus. Second is 70 to 79, then 60 to 69, then 50 to 59, then 40 to 49, then 30 to 39, then 20 to 29, and then younger than 20. Younger than 20 has dropped off the least. They're also the population that has been vaccinated the least. And in fact, every single one of those lines is in the exact order of the amount of vaccination vaccinations that have happened in those populations. That is remarkable. OK, the, the, the fact that older people are able to uh, avoid the hospital is obviously the most important thing here because they're the ones that are most affected by this. But this shows as these vaccinations make it through our society and we are we're doing a pretty darn good job of this. Everyone complains about the people. Oh, gosh, well, we're not vaccinating enough people, whatever that is. The bottom line is we're vaccinating a lot of people and we're vaccinating the people who want it. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? This is America. If they don't want it, they don't have to have it. This is America we're talking about. And you see the dramatic difference that the people just out of, of their own willing need to go get vaccinated. Have, we're seeing the improvements all over the place and we're seeing it quite clearly in data like that. And that's, by the way, consistent around the world, not just here. Um, unless you're talking about the Chinese vaccine, which is it's maybe helping a little bit. Not quite sure about that one, but the ones that we developed here are working really, really well and the British one as well. Um, let me give you this. This is interesting as well. You know, this this there's this panic on the left and there's this panic in the media because they feel like they put themselves in this constant state of being threatened by everyone who's walking by them. They think um, uh, apocalypse is right around the corner all the time. And this is a state they're very familiar with from kind of the world of global warming, though that was kind of more out in the distance. But this is like the the Greta Thunberg at her absolute most panic, the uh, how dare you moment. This is how the left feels all the time. It's going to take them a long time to unwind this if it's ever able to occur. Let's go back. We remember on March 29th, there was a press conference. And here's what the chart looked like at the time of daily cases in the United States. There's a press conference by the CDC director who said, hey, we are in the midst of of impending doom. Impending doom around the corner. There were 64,506 cases on average on May 29th. So just a few weeks later, May 3rd. This is after um, we're, we're Gavin Newsom calls Texas totally reckless. The Neanderthal thinking impending doom around the corner. You cut it by uh, down to 50,707. The update to that is now we're down to 36,648. Another 28 percent drop from May Third, and that is when on May 3rd, 
the CDC came out and said, all right, OK, we've gone the right direction. We're going to release new uh, new guidelines for everyone to deal with. If you've been vaccinated, you can do a lot of the things you used to do. Just got to wear a mask. You got to wear a mask. Very important. The science states you got to wear a mask. So we got this big sheet. I have it right here and it has all the people in green on this side and all the people in green down here towards the bottom. Uh, all these activities, indoor activities, visiting a barber or hair salon, right? They're all masked. They're all masked. Now, as you see on the screen, the new update that came yesterday, they're all unmasked. Now, suddenly, you are able to do all of these things without masks. This is May 4th, and today is May 14th. It's a 10-day difference. Let me ask you this. We're talking about the science. Follow the science. What in the science changed between May 4th, 2021 and May 14th, 2021? Was there an amazing new discovery? Some crazy new experiment I never heard of before? What happened there? We already had a lot of people vaccinated on May 4th. We have slightly more people vaccinated on May 14th. What was the change in the science when May 4th happened. I did a show right here telling you there this there's nothing to support this guys. I'm not a covid denier, but there's nothing to support wearing masks in these situations once you're vaccinated. There's nothing to support it in the science. And now 10 days later, we find out the science was telling us this shit side of the argument with all the people without masks. That's the right one. You can't continue to do this to people. This is why this has been bungled more than you can possibly imagine. What changed? What in the science changed? Nothing. You know, saying follow the science is this like left wing summary of you're dumb because you're conservative and you care about yourself and you're selfish. Science doesn't seem to be the thing you're supposed to follow. It's supposed to be the government and the experts and the media. Even when the science is clear and there are some brave scientists, there's some brave people on the left who are pointing out, wait a minute, the science doesn't really say this. Why do we keep telling people to do this when this isn't what the science says? And eventually, yeah, those people do win out. But after after so much time. I mean, the science has always said no masks outside. The science has always said don't close the schools. The science has always said, once you have COVID, you have immunity. The science has always said, once you're vaccinated, you have immunity. The science didn't change. When you follow the science, you knew all that a long, long time ago. But when you follow that science, you got berated in public, you got harassed, you got hammered. That's not the right way to do this. Give people trustworthy information that they can handle, that they can understand. And repeat it often, but don't change it every two weeks. Keep it similar. And I say two weeks. Don't change it every 10 days. When you say something and you're not certain about it, express that uncertainty and understand that some people will make different choices than you want. That's okay. You can't, you can't say trust the science and then continually mislead people. You've broken that trust. So they can't trust you or the science or the government anymore. Well, you know, it's one of these times where we're having a, a, an explosive house market. I know if you are in that position where you're looking to sell a home, it's really tempting. If you were like, eh, maybe maybe six months from now, well, maybe we'll go a little early. Let's take advantage of this hot spot. Will it last? I don't know. I mean, I don't have too much faith in the Joe Biden economy, but if you're selling a home right now, this is a good time to do it. And when you have a market like this, you got to take advantage. Talk about this with like cryptocurrencies and, and uh, you know, if you're on GameStop, right? Like if you had bought GameStop at the low, got up to the high, you don't want to, you got to, you got to pocket some of those profits. You got to take best advantage of a situation. When you hit the lotto, you got to make sure you don't blow all that money at the strip club the next day. It's just that one of my basic rules, you know, maybe half the money, sure, but not all the money. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Take advantage of this market if you're buying uh, or selling, because if you're buying, you got to, you have a good, good agent to make sure you get the best deal. Things can get out of control quickly. You have someone who can talk, talk some sense into you if you're trying to overbid. 
Keep it calm. Keep it calm. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go. Find the best real estate agent in your area. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Always great to have Dave Rubin on. He's, of course, a Blaze TV host of The Rubin Report and author of Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in the Age of Unreason, which sounds like a terrible idea. It sounds like lots of work, Dave. It's horrific. It will <laughs> age you and exhaust you. You'll realize that everyone around you is a mindless drone. It's a lot to deal with. <laughs> yeah. But still, I would say give it a shot. Yeah. Well, this is, this is one thing I want to talk to you about because you're echoing, I think, a sentiment we talked a little bit about on radio today from Jordan Peterson. You did a tour with Jordan, yeah. um, and it was great, by the way. We saw it here in Dallas. Um, and you guys, uh, he talked on this uh, clip with Tucker Carlson about the importance of truth no matter what the consequences are. Can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, it's really an extraordinary clip, and I did tour with Jordan for about a year and a half. We did about 120 shows in mm -hmm. something like 20 countries. I saw this guy give a different hour and a half lecture every night, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, you know, as a, as a public person, you go out and you give a talk, it's like one <laughs> thing for somebody to give a 10 minute sort of canned <laughs> talk. I try right. to give a slightly different talk all the time, but to give an hour and a half lecture that really was expanding, I would say pushing and pulling his knowledge as far as he could take it every night. And then at the end, he'd say, you know, that's about as far as I can take it tonight. And then I would have the honor of being there the next night where he would pick it up from where he left. So it was really like, it was watching almost someone write a book, like chapter to chapter to chapter. But the specific moment on Tucker Carlson's show was really interesting because what he was talking about was that in his early 20s, he decided to tell the truth, that he felt that telling the truth, no matter the outcome, is the best possible alternative. It doesn't mean that the truth will automatically lead you to something good or something that is painless or uh, fortuitous or financially wonderful or anything. Right. But the truth in and of itself will be the best of all the options. That if you put out a lie, even if you think short term it's going to help you, it will still be worse than the truth. And what he really went on to say that I thought was the interesting part, and that's what we were discussing this morning, he said, that in and of itself, telling the truth for, for the truth's sake, regardless of the outcome, is the ultimate expression of faith. Because that is a leap of faith to say, I will tell the truth. I will tell the truth because I believe truth is important. That's not necessarily factually the best way to go about life at a, at a granular level, right? Because sure. you might be able to lie to a lot of people and get all sorts of success and manipulate all sorts of things. Obviously, that's not the way we would want to live and that's not actually good, but a lot of people could think that. Sure. But the leap of saying, I will tell the truth and no matter what happens at that point, it will be better than all the alternatives. That's a pretty powerful statement and, it, and it's religious in nature, actually. So, because it's really an interesting point and, and I, I, I struggle to find anyone who I would talk to who would say it wasn't true, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's you know, Jordan has a way like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, he just says something that you're like, 100% of people agree with what he just said. Yeah. They don't put it into practice, but 100% would agree with it. Yeah. So where do you, how do you deal with, with omission on this scale? <laughs> right? Like, let me give you an example. It's a great question. Give yeah. an example of this. Because yeah, Lynn Cheney this weekend, she, or week, she gets thrown out of leadership. Her, she would say her truth is Donald Trump was mm -hmm. uniquely terrible past, you know, about this January 6th thing in the election. She voted for him twice. Yeah. But, you know, she said what, the way he handled this was terrible. I have to speak out about it at every single turn. And there was, a, there was a pushback on the side of Republicans who said, look, we might even agree with you on a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, we, we need to move on. We need to do other things. Stop talking about this one thing all the time. Should she have just omitted this? Should, how, does, how, do, how, do you, how do you deal with the, right. with the real so world? Right, so it's, it's a lie by omission mm -hmm. or, well, let's put it even just at a very personal level. It's like, I can't sit here and tell you that I tell the truth every possible second, sure. all day long, at every moment. Mm -hmm. Someone might ask me, how my day's going? Oh, it's going sure. fine. Well, That's it great. might be that something horrible is happening, <laughs> right. but like, you know, we all have small instances or, or white lies or anything else. I think the broader question, is really on the big stuff, on the stuff that matters, mm -hmm. will you put order into the universe? You know, we're, we're in this phase right now where truth is being destroyed because everything has become so political and po politics is a game of manipulation, not a game of truth. Mm -hmm. So it's like nothing that this administration says is truthful. Nothing that anyone's telling us about lockdowns or science or anything yeah. else is truthful. So. Is omission in and of itself, is that a sin if we're taking it to that like religious level? I think we can all do the best we can within that. That would be, it would right. really be for you to figure out like what works for Stu and yeah. you know, that, you know, if you've got a friend and they've got spinach in their tooth, 
You know, it's <laughs> yeah, like, do you yeah, want to tell not, them yeah. at that very moment? Like, I got to tell you the truth, man, right this second. But you don't want to do it in front of people and embarrass them. But otherwise, they're being embarrassed anyway because they got spinach in the tooth. Like, mm-hmm. we could do many versions of this. But I think, I think in the best way that you can do it, if you can do it, I agree with Jordan's premise that it will be the best outcome. And then that in and of itself that is a leap of faith, which is really such a cool concept if yeah. you think about it. It yeah. really is. It really yeah. is. Um, I think we saw some of this with the pandemic. You mentioned it a little bit there. Early on, uh, Anthony Fauci comes out and says, ah, masks, we don't need masks, we don't need masks. And then, uh, okay, now we do need them. And when asked later on, he said, well, at the time, there was a shortage and people uh, at hospitals uh, that we didn't want people hoarding them so people at hospitals could get them. I mean, he admitted that he just basically tried to manipulate the public by saying the opposite of what he believed to be true. We've seen this over and over and over again. I think we've seen it recently in the CDC. They all know vaccinated people should be able to go out and do basically whatever they want, right? Of course. And so, it, but they're saying the opposite. And it seems like the reason is they think if they say vaccinated people can do everything, unvaccinated people will go out and start doing everything and we'll have issues. But again, instead of being honest and truthful, they're trying to manipulate this for some better outcome. So then when you look at that at the macro level, it's like, look what they've done to the truth, actually, by lying. They've not only lied about the specific instances about whether you should wear masks or not, or, you know, when a a ban from China happens, it's racist, but when a ban from India (laughs) happens, it's somehow not racist. Or we can't call it the China virus or the Wuhan flu, but we can call it the Brazil variant or something like that. These insanely <laughs> diametrically opposed ideas that they throw in front of us all the time. It's not only a lie in and of itself, but it but it's doing something much more dangerous. And I think that's really what Jordan's talking about, which is then the structure of the universe, basically, our ability to move forward now as a nation going forward from now May of twenty one of twenty twenty one is damaged because so many of us no longer believe them. So, I mean, it's the boy who cried wolf. When they tell us the truth, and I suspect every now and again, somebody accidentally at least tells the truth from these people. But Fauci may accidentally tell the truth, you know, every (laughs) once in a while, he may just lose it, you know? Like, in essence, you've damaged the brand of truth so much that we're not gonna believe you. I mean, that's really how I feel at this point. Is there anything Fauci would tell me at this point that I would be like, you know what? That's a forthright guy. Sure, he maybe made a couple mistakes and Mm -hmm. it's a tough job and it's a pandemic and there's a lot going on. But now I believe him. Well, I, I don't think we could get to that point, you know? What did George yeah. W. Bush say about fooling? Fool me once, it, fool me again, I'm not a fool, something right, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're, you're looking at the country over the past year and you're, Dave Rubin's putting a rating down. Did we do a good job handling this? Did we do a bad job handling this? Pretty horrific, I would say, yeah. pretty horrific. There are glimmers mm-hmm. of, of goodness. I would say Ron DeSantis is the mm-hmm. shining star in yeah. the hill of yeah. like, how do you do it right? How do you deal with this honestly while not destroying your state, while respecting liberty, while respecting people's choice, respecting the ability for us to live? I mean, you know, even if the pandemic was, was say 10 times worse mm-hmm. than, than whatever it actually turned out to be, well, that doesn't necessarily, we should have a philosophical argument about, well, what would be the precautions that would be legit at that point? Like, it's not the government's job to just keep us safe and right. just keep us locked down like children. Like, life is about some risk. But, but we never had any of those discussions. It was sort of like two weeks to flatten the curve. And by the way, at two weeks to flatten the curve, we all did it. Mm-hmm. Everyone did it. We, I do I not just... know one person, and I did not see virtually any pushback. Maybe from the most sort of anarchist kind of libertarian types, mm-hmm. but but everyone was washing their bags when they got home from supermarkets yeah. and wearing gloves. We all did it. We did it for the, I'd say the first six weeks. I mean, oh, first, first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. remember they extended it for another month through April. And I mean, I remember in Texas, they opened up to 25% capacity here in restaurants on May 1st. And we went, going out to dinner was weird yeah. that first day. But like, people weren't like, uh, I think people took that advice as, as, as about as to the heart, uh, close to heart as they could. Right, so we did what they asked of us. Right. And then once we did what they asked of us, I think, you know, I don't mean this to sound conspiratorial, but I think that it's just the way humanity works. It's the way systems work. People in power then thought, well, what else could we get them to do? And let's see how long we can push this thing. And I remember mm-hmm. in about April of 2020 or so, so it's over a year ago, April or May of 2020, I remember in California, they said, we're gonna lock down till August 1st. And that was when I finally broke. I did it for the six weeks, whatever mm-hmm. it was, mm-hmm. didn't go out, barely walked my dog, like the, all yeah. the stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. I did all the stuff. 
But when they said that, when Gavin Newsom said, we're now shutting down till August 1st, I knew it was all nonsense because A, these arbitrary dates make no sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, our, August 1st, okay, well, why not July 30th or, you know, like, it's just so it's an arbitrary mm -hmm. date, but also I knew at that point there's no way we're gonna be open on August 1st. And clearly that isn't the case because California, as we sit here right now, is still not technically opening till June 15th, and we'll even see about that. And the even scarier part is the psychological damage that they've done to all of these people where they probably won't open up. The, the state maybe will open, but the people won't. Yeah, we're seeing that, I think, the very early pieces of this, and you were in the liberal media, the, no. as we would, might say, for a while. You were the you liberal media. You bring me media. on your show to insult me. <laughs> no. I, mean, I think you have an interesting, sure. you have a unique perspective yeah. as uh, uh, to, to that world that I don't have. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw like Rachel Maddow, for example, come out last night and just like, be like I don't know if I'm going to be able to take my mask off. I don't know if I'm going to be able to see someone walking down the street without a mask and not think they're a bad person. Her brain has been rewired. Yeah. Those are her words, not yes. mine. She had her brain rewired. She should have had her brain rewired, yeah. but not because of COVID. <laughs> not this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, there are a lot of people with yeah. a lot of goblins bouncing around in their head over this stuff, and it's going to take them a long time to get over it. We may never get over it culturally and sort of holistically at a, at a national level. Mm. I think, in, you know, it's weird. Right now we really feel this thing where here I am in Dallas, Texas, and it feels very different than when I'm in Los Angeles, California. And that's a little scary at some level because we're used to being one nation, right? Mm -hmm. We're one nation under God. However, the founders set this place up to kind of be this way, right? Like this is what federalism is, that yep. you're gonna basically live in a state that should do most of the stuff related to your life in terms of taxation and all of these things. So in many ways, we're actually going back to our roots. It feels a little scary right now, and we still have problems related to that because if places like California fully go under, does someone here in Texas have any responsibility that to a, a state that's completely mismanaged? I mean, we could have great debates about that. Mm -hmm. I, as a guy that lives in that blue state, I would prefer somebody to help, but I get why you wouldn't want to. I get why you wouldn't want to, you know? And I get I get why once I move, I'm not gonna want to do right. it too. Mm -hmm. um, but in some ways, the system actually is working right now. It's just hard to see. And I guess the parts that are working, say the Texas, Tennessee, Florida parts, they're not, there's not enough of them. There's yeah. just not enough of them working. And also you're not seeing that on mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there, there's this weird two Americas thing going on right now. I mean, I, I, you obviously living in, in California are seeing this on that side, but we have visitors that come down, friends of mine from New York, Connecticut, and they can't understand what the society is down here. And I, I feel like it's long-term, a real scarring thing for the country. Yes. And I, I don't think it's, I'm not the type who's gonna say it was completely, uh, you know, like it's not some crazy thing that they, you know, there was real reason to, to, to have some, especially at the beginning, to, to be scared about this, and it did do a lot of damage. But like, I, I think of it almost like how like my grandparents and great-grandparents would talk about the Depression years, where they were just like scarred, everything had to be saved, everything had, they, they, they had that defining um, early life sort of change and never were we able to shake it for their entire existence. And I feel like there's a good chunk of this generation that's gonna happen to. Yes, and it's also a generation that unfortunately has been told that their, their perceived oppression, whatever it might be, whether it's their skin color or their sexuality or their gender, that that somehow gives them virtue. Mm -hmm. So if you can then say, I was the most affected by this, I was suicidal during this, yeah. my grandma died and I couldn't do this and all those things. By the way, some of the things that happened were horrific, yeah, right? Yeah. Grandma's dying bad, young people dying bad. There weren't many young people that died, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But because we've told them in so many cases, whatever's wrong in the world is, is the thing that has the most value to you, they're not gonna let go of this thing. And that is why Rachel Maddow seemed to me as I watched the clip, she seemed like a crazy person. <laughs> you're sitting in front of a camera telling people that your brain has been rewired and you're afraid of your common citizen who's not wearing a mask. To be quite honest, I'm more afraid of people wearing masks at this point because it says to me, well, either you don't follow the science or it's a year and a half later and what else can they get you to do? How about we should all put clown noses on, right? Clown noses because, you know, usually they're of, they're a sort of, what is that? It's like a mushy, cushiony yeah, kind like of thing. Spongy, they're yeah. usually like a spongy mm -hmm. thing. Well, if you put that on your nose, it seems like it would have something to do to help COVID. Maybe, you say. Yeah. So what if we get people in masks, but you can lower the mask, but you get a clown nose, like it seems like that would help. Like you could, the point is you could get yeah, these yeah. people to do anything. That's the test that yeah. we failed. What will they do next? Oh, and you look through history and that when that thing turns on, when that part of the human brain allows 
that sort of disconnection from what's right and what's wrong, bad things tend to happen. Yeah. Um, I will say, if you go to Dave Rubin's uh, Twitter feed, you can see him <laughs> citing examples all day today. Uh, about <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on a real run today. Uh, leftism is a mental disorder. Yeah. Uh, um, this is, can people expect this for, I mean, this is a long-term thing where people can see you highlighting these moments? So all I'm doing today is <laughs> screen capping just like the <laughs> latest leftist crazy nonsense, including Miss mm-hmm. Maddow. Yeah. And, and I'm just writing leftism is a mental disorder. <laughs> and they're, they're all catch and fire, which is great. And it's like, I don't know, I guess I could do this probably for the rest of my life because these yeah. people ain't going to stop. So it would be a different type of Twitter than people have become accustomed to me to. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> the, the thoughtful Dave Rubin, uh, yeah. what everyone ex- expect is yeah. now going to be calling people, uh, telling people mental, they have a mental disorder. But that's yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, I will say you can do that for a while. But then eventually, of course, they will cancel your account and you will no longer be able to do it. But and I do like posting pictures of steak every now and again. Yeah, so, so there you go. Yeah. You have to do that, yeah. too. Uh, Dave Rubin is the host of The Rubin Report right here on Blaze TV and author of Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in the Age of Unreason. And that's definitely the age we're in. Dave, thanks for coming on, man. Now we're in the age of insanity. So for the next print, I'm going to see if we can <laughs> do that. Thanks, too. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Back in a second. Andrew Cuomo wants to follow the science. I mean, not all the science, some of the science. He says in New York, we've always relied on the facts and the science to guide us throughout the worst of this pandemic and our successful reopening. That's that's successful. Uh, reopening. Let me just put this Andrew Cuomo's awful mug out here just so you can see it. Um, he is now saying, well, you know, they want to let people out and do whatever they want if they're vaccinated. Sorry, that's not that's not really us. Same thing coming from Nancy Pelosi, who, by the way, there we go. Uh, Nancy Pelosi sex pen, Nancy Pelosi sex mug. She's saying she's going to keep the mask mandate on the House floor, despite the fact that everyone's vaccinated. And the CDC just said you didn't have to do it anymore. Why? I mean, is it about control? Is it just that she sucks? Both of them, the answer is uh, yes. If you're trying to stay fit and healthy, you know, like me, there's so much good food out there in the world, it's tough to avoid. But you need a built bar every once in a while. In fact, maybe every day. My wife eats one of these every single day, and she looks a hell of a lot better than I do. Uh, it's high in protein, high in fiber low in calories, low in carbs. So you get kind of all the great, the, the, the stats, you come here for stats, right? The stats are excellent on Built Bars. We're talking like 130 calories, like 14 grams of protein, even more on some of these bars. Um, but really, then you come to also meet for, to me to tell you what tastes good. And Built Bar is the thing that tastes good. If you want a protein bar that is going to fill you up, going to give you protein that you need, it's going to be low calorie, low, um, low carb, but also tastes delicious. Built Bar is really the only place you can go for something like that. The promo code is STU15, 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 save 15% off your next order. Go to BuiltBar.com, promo code STU15. Don't forget to use that promo code STU15 because you'll save 15% off, and that's how they know you like this stupid show. BuiltBar.com, promo code STU15. As you might know, watching this program, uh, I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment, and I believe it's vital for the future of our country. Um, However, I'm not like really a gun guy. I mean, I grew up in Connecticut, so I don't know what what I'm talking about when it comes to the inner workings of these things a lot of the times. One of the guys I always go to when I have a question about this and I'm I'm thinking about what does this actually mean is Stephen Gutowski. He's at the Washington Free Beacon for a long time and just started something called TheReload.com. Stephen is with us now. Thanks for coming on the program. Hey, thanks for having me, Stu. Uh, Stephen, before we get into the the issues of the day here, um, tell me why you started The Reload. Yeah, well, essentially, I I felt like there needed to be uh, a place for more informed uh, firearms journalism, you know, reporting and analysis. And, you know, there's just not a lot of that out there when you look around uh, major media. And so I figured I'd start a place like that myself uh, where I could dedicate full time uh, my efforts to try and, you know, uncover interesting stories about people who own guns, why they own them, uh, and as well, you know, the politics of guns on the Hill. Uh, you know, think what's coming down the line on gun regulation, what is that fight shaping up to be, what's President Biden doing, you know, all that sort of stuff. I wanted there to be a place where people could come and get, you know, informed reporting and analysis on that. Well, I can't recommend your reporting uh, highly enough for people who are interested in this issue. You're, you're always very careful, and I, I do really appreciate the way you uh, go through everything in detail. Um, can you kind of walk us through 
this ghost gun issue. This is something that I don't think any, most people had never even heard of ghost guns until there's this like effort to make this sort of, I don't know, from the left to make sort of a boogeyman out of this that is this really big problem we're having in our country. Is that true? What is the story behind this? Yeah, essentially ghost guns are, uh, you know, it's kind of a colloquial term for um, guns that don't have serial numbers on them, basically homemade firearms, um, which have been, you know, legal to do uh, in America since well, really before the founding. Um, you could make your own firearms for your own personal use at home, and people do that. Um, now, the concern is obviously over, uh, you know, criminals making their own firearms and the inability to trace where those guns came from if they're recovered at a uh, crime scene. And so that's why they call them ghost guns. You know, they're they're untraceable um, in terms of, you know, they don't have a, a serial number that you can trace back to where they were first sold or what manufacturer made them, something like that. So th that's really what it's referring to. It seems like they're, the pr presentation of them I, that I get from the media generally is that these things are very common. They're almost exclusively used by criminals to avoid being traced. I mean, is, is, what's the type of person that buys a ghost gun? Who is that? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly you do have criminals using them uh, to some degree. I don't, I don't know that I would call it common. You know, the ATF uh, in their uh, release of, um, you know, their, their proposal to try and ban the sale of unfinished firearm parts, they said they've recovered, I believe, uh, a couple thousand um, over the last several years. Um, uh, you know, compared to how many guns are used in crime, you know, the traditional way, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a terribly popular way for criminals to obtain guns at this point, because generally speaking, it requires a significant amount of work to <laughs> finish uh, one of these unfinished parts to make, you know, a gun at home yourself. And, and criminals are oftentimes not looking to do that. They they want, you know, an easy, easier path to get their guns. And so usually they steal them or, or buy them. Uh, have friends who don't have records buy them, and then they pass them around between each other. That's usually how criminals, you know, handle firearms. And so, this is not—it's not necessarily a very common way to get uh, a gun if you're a criminal. But it is a way that uh, a lot of people who are, um, you know, philosophically inclined to support the Second Amendment uh, for reasons of resisting government tyranny, um, they—you know—you have people who like that concept, and that's why they build. Uh, homemade guns uh, so that there's no record of them owning a gun, even, um, you know, and it doesn't mean that they're criminals necessarily. They just have a philosophical belief that the government shouldn't know where everyone, everyone's guns are, even the, you know, the law abiding people. So uh, that's really what the two main uses of these are. And I would say that the, the hobbyist use or the, the philosophical use is, is much more common than the criminal use. And uh, of course, this is the reason why the second amendment exists largely in the first place. Um, so why is this becoming an issue with the Biden administration then? If it's not going to stop crime, is it just essentially trying to highlight sort of this exotic thing that people don't understand to build a case for more gun regulation? Yeah, um, well, you know, the, obviously the Biden administration would say that the problem is that these are untraceable and some criminals do use them. And so, uh, you know, the ATF has had a problem with them for a long time and the ATF wants to have more uh, authority and oversight, as you might imagine, like most government agencies do. Um, and so, you know, they, they argue that it's becoming a bigger problem now. Uh, they're recovering more of these, even if the numbers are still relatively small. But um, certainly I think part of it is that the president doesn't have a lot of options in what he can do on his own. You know, obviously the presidency is very powerful, but it does have a lot of limitations in terms of like, he can't just ban, you know, the sale of AR-15s on his own through executive action. He can't he can't do things like that. So he's looking at what he can do. And this is an area where he can take action. You know, he can he can try and mess with the regulations that exist to expand the authority of the ATF to go after these sort of unfinished uh, uh, gun parts. Well, I, you know, and I think this is my question here. Can he do something? Because I, I I don't know. We worked, you know, we had a book that came out a while ago about uh, guns, and we worked with Alan Gura, who is an attorney that argued in front of the Supreme Court in Heller. Um, I, the more I look at it, 
the more I don't think he has the uh, the opportunity to regulate in this way. I mean, I, I don't and I would say I said the same thing about Trump with bump stocks. I don't I don't understand how these guys have any of these rights to be doing this. They seem to be just overreaching and no one's really calling them on it. You know what? That's a fair point. Um, I shouldn't be too overly broad. This is one thing he thinks he has the authority to do at the very <laughs> okay. least. Um, and certainly he's going to face uh, not only legal uh, pressure if it does come into law, but right now um, that we're in a comment period with public comment. And, and so uh, there, he's trying to tr- change a regulation and there's a whole process to get through that. And that that doesn't even necessarily guarantee success. The Obama administration tried to ban uh, so-called green tip ammunition, 5.56 five, ammunition that's common in, for, for uh, AR-15s. And that didn't make it through public comments, the same basic process. Um, and you brought up the bump stock ban, that, that's another good example. That made it through into law, but that's facing legal challenge now too, and actually just lost, um, I believe in the Seventh Circuit. So, you know, it's not entirely clear that even if this goes through and makes it into regulation, that it will stand up in court. It certainly uh, will be challenged and it absolutely could lose. So uh, where would you say uh, we are as far as the 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 the, the, the current right now? Um, we had obviously the Heller decisions back, what, 2008 now? I mean, it's been a long time uh, since we've had a major ruling in the Supreme Court on the Second Amendment. Do we have cases that are coming up that are going to uh, codify our gun rights a little further? It seems like there's a hesitance from the Supreme Court right now to take these cases on. Yeah, there absolutely has been. And you've actually seen uh, Supreme Court justices complain about that publicly. uh, Justice Thomas has complained about it repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Justice Kavanaugh uh, complained about it. Um, You know, and actually there is really good news for gun rights supporters on that front because the court just took up uh, a new Second Amendment case. It's actually a very significant one as well. It's it's challenging New York's um, concealed carry law uh, and the fact that essentially their government officials can deny you uh, a permit if they don't think you have a good enough reason to carry. It's a very subjective standard. Mm. Um, it's not a very common one. It's only about eight states have this type of law now. Most states, if you pass the background check and you do the training, uh, they'll issue you a permit. Or some states don't even require a permit at all as long as you're you know, legally allowed to own a gun, you can carry it. And so New York has this very strict uh, statute that the court is now is taking up. Um, and I think a lot of people are expecting that that will get struck down um, and you'll see at least a form of shall issue, you know, that where you, you absolutely have to issue the permit if, if the applicant is, uh, has passed all the, the, the hurdles. Uh, and that will be a really big deal, I think. Yeah, that, that, that'll be very good news. Um, Stephen, what's the best way for people to uh, support your new venture? I think it's an important one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, the reload.com, if you go and sign up for the, there's a free weekly newsletter and you'll get um, all the best gun news of the, the week uh, straight into your inbox. And then if you want more exclusive content, more uh, analysis, and you want to support the reload to make sure that it can even survive because it's totally reader funded, you can buy a membership. Uh, we got monthly memberships, annual memberships, and we even have a co-founders uh, membership for people who want to have, uh, you know, exclusive range day with me and and really help this survive because it just launched um, uh, just a month ago and we've had a really great response so far. That's great, man. I'm, I'm really excited you're doing this and thank you for, you know, taking the effort and I know taking a step out there to do something like this is not always easy. Uh, so thank you for doing it. It's an important right and we, we definitely have to defend it. Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right, Stephen Gutowski, journalist. Uh, Target is no longer going to sell Pokemon cards uh, along with baseball cards and such. Why? Because people are getting fights over them. (laughs) Apparently, uh, one of the incidents involved a a, a situation where four people attacked a guy uh, who then pulled his gun on them. Uh, kind of a big deal. I mean, look, I once got in a fist fight over, with a friend over a Joe Carter baseball card from the Toronto Blue Jays, so I get it. But I was also like 15 years old, and you know, Carter's a real person, not a cartoon with an annoying pun-based name. So I'm just throwing that out there.